Okay, los geht's. All right, we should be live. Um, welcome, everybody. So this is a live stream experiment from Matthias and me. Uh, we will watch my latest video together and uh, react to it, pause at certain p moments because there's a lot more detail that I just couldn't pack into the video and Matthias neither. Uh, and you're very active in the chat already, so uh, we also try to answer some questions. And yeah, that's the plan. Oh, and after we are finished watching the video, I will reveal the giveaway winner. So stay tuned for the end and let's begin. Uh, Matthias, are you there? Yeah. Can people hear yes. you? Yes. I'm sure they can. All right. I forgot one thing. Um, I will this. So now you can see the video. I can control it and play and pause it. And Matthias can do it as well. That was pretty tricky to get this set up because I'm here in Germany. Matthias is in Canada, but we managed to do that. So here we go. 25 edge clamps because buying 25 of these is a little expensive. Oh. I needed them for a furniture project and as their name suggests, they clamp stuff to an edge and automatically adjust themselves to any thickness up to 45 millimeters. Pretty cool. I thought this would be a quick side project, but <laughs> I was so wrong. Did Here I can already tell you, um, I started the furniture project when I then thought, oh, I need to glue on some really large edge bending. It, it's pretty thick and it has a L-shaped profile to it. And there I knew various other edge clamping methods just don't work. Uh, as well as painter's tape, as many people commented. Um, and then I thought, oh, I should build edge clamps. And then it was a long process. Dipping my toes into the production world kicked my butt and forehead. We'll get to that. I had to think differently when designing these because everything matters when you have to do it 30 times. Wait, 30 clamps? Yes, I will give five of them away to one of you. More on that later. Now let's engineer some clamps for a small production run. It starts with... So Mary's is saying... 30 times, but you look at the clamps and uh, they're symmetrical, so they're actually a lot of things are done 60 times, <laughs> and then some of these symmetrical, the ends have both sides, so there's actually 120 mortise and tenons in there, and I appreciate how difficult that is. I once uh, tried selling uh, my Jenga pistol, trying selling those online, and I made 25 of those, and I didn't plan it out as carefully as Marius did, and I made some mistake at some point, and then having to fix that same mistake 25 times is very annoying. Oh yeah. The frame, which needs to be strong, because as you tighten the screw, the eccentric cams try to spread the frame apart. It's interesting to compare my design to the commercial one. They've used a single cast aluminum part. Perfect choice. Now that's no option for me, so I have a hardwood C frame, and to make this strong, it needs proper joinery. Like a Somebody commented I could have easily cast my own aluminum frames like yeah just do that and that and that yeah it sounds easy when you do it one time but again think about casting 30 clamp frames it's not easy and then Honestly, you see people casting then you see people casting aluminum on YouTube and <laughs> the castings look rather rough and these uh these thin uh, ends around here, like the, it probably wouldn't even flow in there, or if it did, there'd probably be like some cavity in there, so that there would be a spot where it would easily break. Yes, yeah, that's like this is get all difficult to get right when casting. And question there as well: Have I thought about welding? Oh yeah, that was also common. I should have made steel frames. And have I ever heard of welding? Um, 
you will see actually later in the video that the frame is not the limiting factor of this whole clamp design. So making it from steel would have just been wasted time, steel and welding. It's stronger, yes, but doesn't matter because a different component fails first. So making them from wood, I actually have them here, is better because they are lightweight. And I think that's a little bit better than having super strong steel frames that do nothing. And probably more work as well, just in terms of all the machining that would have to be done for every frame. Yeah. Or a double mortise and tenon, or a bridle joint, or a finger joint, or scrap the whole hardwood and make it from plywood. But which one is the strongest? I don't know, so let's find out. I made two samples of each option as an almost finished C-frame with most of the features. But since my best measuring equipment is a suitcase scale, for the actual testing I called in the expert Matthias Wondel and his joint strength tester. I did one test on camera with the suitcase scale. The joint broke, but you couldn't see anything. So th this had just no value. <laughs> and um, before this transition now happens, uh, I introduced Matthias to the idea of working together on this project. And from the beginning, I basically already decided on the double mortise and tenon joint that I wanted to use. And we talked to each other and more or less both agreed which joints um, will be, uh, would be the strongest. And for me, the test Matthias did was more of a verification that my assumption was correct. And it was. So single mortise and tenon fails first, then bridle, then double mortise and tenon, then finger joint. And uh, plywood just doesn't even uh, work. Well, it was the strongest until we drilled the hole in there. But the uh, more significant finding is this reinforcement here, which I added because I tested a few and they just split apart right here. The reinforcement wasn't strong enough on this one. So that was really the most significant finding. Yeah. Is that the wood needs reinforcing. You can't really see it on mine because it's painted, but oh. we'll get to that later in the video. Let's, let's continue. My tester has this motorized screw jack which sits on some load cells to measure the force and that lifts up on this side which pulls on the clamp frame until it breaks. First one is a regular mortise and tenon joint. That's 50 kilograms now. Definitely seeing quite a bit of flex there now. So it's opened up by this much. Okay. Whoa! Now the failure wasn't the joint at all, it was uh, just the wood right here. Next up, a bridle joint, and I want to see better how much this flexes, so I'm just going to stick this piece of wood in here, that'll make that more obvious. 90, 100, and you can see it opened up quite a bit already. 125, and we broke the wood again. So these more complicated joints, like a double mortise and tenon joint, aren't going to help any if the wood breaks. But we've got uh, two plywood samples here, which are not going to split apart on the end, so I'll try those next. Quick interruption here. There was a question from James. Uh, if two dowels through the joint would have helped any? Uh, probably not. It would have been more or less the same as the mortise and tenon joint, the single one. About the same glue surface area and... Uh, yeah not a really strong joint in this application. 70 kilograms now and we can see it opened up a fair bit so there is some kind of flexing in the wood already. 170, man that's a lot of bending. Holy crap that piece is so bent now. Uh, 230 now, I just hope I don't break my test setup. 275, Question yes, okay, to you, come on, come on, fail yes, um, I'm trying to pause, but I think we're both trying to control your yeah. desktop at the same time. Uh, Where are yes, you scared? Was the, lever arm, was the lever arm taking into account that it doubles the force? Oh, no, okay. I would have never imagined that the <laughs> lever doubles the force. I would have completely missed that, even though I've built the whole setup. 
the fact that the lever doubles the force would have never occurred to me in a million years. Sarcasm here. <laughs> Um, but my question to you, were you scared, uh, when you saw this, that, what? I don't know, something breaks, hits you, breaks the setup? Or... Um, I wasn't too worried about it. I mean, it's, it always makes good video when things pop rather nicely, but, uh, eventually I got tired of picking up the pieces. So I put a few screws in there, um, where the pieces join, not this, not to hold things together because I want them to move freely, but just so that when it jumps, it can't jump too far. So the screw is just kind of loosely in there holding things together, which in retrospect was something I should have done sooner because when the pieces do go flying, um, there's always a good chance that they hit the camera. Um, and that would, that would be expensive. <laughs> All right. Something's gonna fail. Oh, okay. And the wood itself failed here. The final fail strength was 280 kilograms. So this is before I drilled the holes in the plywood because Marys was keen on getting these things to me early on in the process. And so they didn't have the holes for the actual screw to go through, which is why I tested these without the hole in them, the first ones. And then Marys is like, oh yeah, they should have this hole in them. So I drilled the same size hole that he said he put into his, or was putting into his. And of course, at that point, I used up my plywood ones, so I had to make new ones out of Baltic birch, which... I'm not sure if it's exactly the same stuff, but they were not very strong after drilling those holes because it just takes away too much of the plywood. Whoa. I decided to try reinforcing the ends of the joints, uh, first with the ones I already broke and glued back together, just to make sure that would actually work. So these would be ready for retesting, except Mary's pointed out there needs to be a hole drilled through here like this where the clamping screw goes through, so I have to add that too, because that potentially weakens the frame. 110, this is about where it failed before. Oh, I think it's starting to yield now. So it looks like those mortise and tenon joints are starting to pull apart now. And the force has dropped enough now that uh, it's declared failed, and I'm pretty sure this is just pulling out here now. So I'm seeing, just a comment here, uh, actually to you, have you tested how much pressure is really needed to put on edge banding and I think people are thinking of like really thin edge banding um, but uh, it depends on what you edge clamp certainly for myself when I edge clamp sometimes I need all the force that I can get because I'm usually gluing on something that's fairly thick and if it doesn't fit neatly all along you just have to force it on there at which point um, you want as much force as you can get sometimes. Also, sometimes if you're trying to seat a mortise and tenon joint and the glue is starting to set up on you, it's, like, it's an insane amount of force you end up applying trying to get it in there. So, how much force is needed? It depends. Yeah, um, to just squeeze the gap tight in a really thin edge bending, it doesn't take much force. But if the strip of edge bending is really long, you just need to spread the force everywhere. If you do it with uh, just a few clamps, you need a board that's stiff and then can apply pressure to consistently to the whole edge and they need just a lot more force or you just need a lot of clamps. And in the case of my furniture project where the edge is really long and has profile to it, it's not certain that the piece is straight to begin with, so I need to force it into straight over the whole length and doing that with a solid piece of hardwood, that takes force. So yeah, again, it depends. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, <laughs> but uh, these produce enough. That's uh, what I can say for sure. Oh, I just see here somebody says, hey, somebody just recently mentioned Marius untested with Adam Savage. Cool. So maybe Adam Savage knows about you too? Oh, really? Uh, yeah, uh, I met him. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, I, I, I met him at open source and talked to him really quickly. It was behind stage just before I got on stage. But, uh, yeah, it was a weird confrontation. Um, me being a little nervous just before getting on stage and then this Adam Savage in front of you 
talking to you. Hey, I really <laughs> like your projects. Is it? And it was just a lot of going on there. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk to him a bit more. We'll I, see. Yeah, uh, he he mentioned me a few times on his Maker Fair talks years ago. So I thought, oh, I'll just shoot him an email. So I sent him an email and no reply. So I was like, okay, whatever. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like beg or anything. It's like if he ignores me, that's fine. I just read in the chat. Uh, I'm a bit too quiet. Uh, I can get the microphone a bit closer if that helps. Let's continue. With both of the uh, repaired reinforced ones failing at the joint or near the joint, I figured that was a good idea. So off camera, I did the rest of them. So glue failed on this one and it's just kind of popped out the edge here. So this is a double mortise and tenon joint which should have a lot more glue area. I expect this to be stronger. So this is now more than the uh, bridle joint had. But it's definitely, whoa! It's definitely starting to fail, I was gonna say. And this one mostly failed in the wood, but you can see here it's a rather unfortunate uh, grain orientation. And the reinforcement itself uh, failed on this one too. And this second double mortise and tenon joint had an interesting failure. I'd say uh, this hole in here definitely contributed. Next, uh, the double bridle joint, or finger joint as Maris calls it, that one should be the strongest if the wood doesn't fail. Well, that's the strongest one so far. Looks like it might be failing around the hole here. Yes, there's definitely something opening up around the hole. The force has dropped enough that it's declared failed. 180 kilograms, but the peak was 202. All right, Marius, here's my results. Uh, weakest was the mortise and tenon joints uh, pulling out. The bridle joints kind of split apart right here. Next was the double mortise and tenon joint. One failed around the hole, the other one split around at the reinforcement. And the finger joint, uh, same thing, one split around the hole and the other one split at the reinforcement so the reinforcement wasn't big enough best were the plywood ones but uh, these ones i tested before i drilled this hole and that hole is a cause of failure so to make it fair i made uh, two more plywood joints and both of these just kind of tear apart at the hole and that made them the weakest not the strongest so the strongest joints were the double mortise and tenon joint and the finger joint uh, both being limited by the strength of the wood around the hole and the reinforced end splitting apart. All right. There was a question to you, Matthias. Uh, are, is that really scary when the clamps explode? <laughs> no, not really. Like uh, I've, uh, I've done plenty of uh, tests where uh, joints fail spectacularly, and I always kind of like it when they do go with a bang because <laughs> it just makes for much better. It makes the video more interesting. That does good for a video. Most, <laughs> if it's just, uh, especially if I have my, depending on what I have the threshold set to, like, um, I can tell when a joint is going to fail long before it goes bang. Just like if there's like a 10% drop in force, uh, quite often I just have it stop the test there so that um, I catch it early on. Um, but that makes it less spectacular sometimes. So actually, I, partway through this, I actually changed the threshold. So I was looking for like, I think a 30% drop in force before I stopped the test because this <laughs> was just, just to get more of a, the nice failure because of the yeah. you know it looks like it just stops the test is like okay done it's like what that didn't fail because there's no visible failure yet sometimes have you broke any of your equipment with these tests yet no surprisingly wow that's really lucky <laughs> <laughs> yeah the uh I'm, I'm always a bit worried about the uh the raspberry pi that's running it all so I try to put that behind the monitor so that the flying pieces don't hit that one. And nothing is protected with like a cover, all open electronics. Um, yeah, so the Raspberry Pi, I try to put that a bit. Um, there's also the stepper motor controller, but that's got an enclosure. Uh, and then there's the load cell amplifier, which is with the Raspberry Pi. So I try to put that and it's got long enough wires. I can put that a bit out of the way. And then there's also the camera, but that being on the stick uh, up on a pedestal, it's much less likely to get hit when things go flying down. All right, let's continue. And I forgot something. I can change the screen. All right, thanks, Matthias, for breaking my stuff and the results. 
you should definitely check out his more detailed video about the testing. That's worth watching as well. I Have you already watched that? If not, go watch it after the live stream. We'll now go <laughs> Don't with watch it right now. the double mortise and tenon joints because that's easier to glue and considering the amount, it's the best overall option. So let's start the production. The material is birch hardwood. And that was not uh, the best. Basically, the first mistake uh, choice, but I had some boards left over. We have to pause now. <laughs> oh, I was trying to pause. I think we're both trying to pause. They're yeah. Pausing each other. Uh, I saw the uh, comments about vacuum bagging. No, not practical at all because you get so little force. So you're just gonna the vacuum bag would just jam everything up, and you can't don't have good access on it anymore. Oh, for gluing on an edge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, um, what I just said, uh, I started with a birch, which is not the best choice for a high strength application when you want to use wood. I just had these pieces left over and I didn't knew in the beginning that this would be a insanely deep, deep rabbit hole I would get myself into. If I would have bought the wood new, for this project specifically, I would have chosen ash or maple. Both are much better choices than birch. Birch is kind of flexible, which is the opposite of uh, what you want in a clamp frame. But I had them left over. I didn't want them to uh, go wasted. So that's what I used. From a different project, which otherwise would have been burned. I mold them into strips and cut them to length. The joinery gets done with the Panther router and a custom template I made. This machine uses a router to copy the shape of the template to the workpiece. If you want to see this in more detail, check out my last video. But here's the workflow. Quick question uh, to you. Do you still speak German? <laughs> He's laughing. Because yes, he does. And our communication was just German the whole time. Uh, he is still really good at it. Like you couldn't even tell that he doesn't live in Germany since, I don't know, 40, 50 years now. 43 years, yeah. But yeah, so it's, we were, it's kind uh, of hard for us now to talk English to each other. And for you, we talk German the whole, the whole time. It's Although it's been weird now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's continue. With the follower in the slots of the template, I can cut the mortises. And with the follower around the slots, I can cut the tenons. The tapered shape of the template allows me to dial in the perfect fit. All right, the C-frame construction is done. Gluing comes later because next I'll tackle the challenge of the clamping handle. On the commercial version, they use a high-pitched trapezoidal screw and the threads cut into the frame. So low part count and one manufacturing step about as good as it gets. And again, this is not really a feasible option for me. Taking apart this clamping screw took me 15 minutes. It's so hard to get apart again, this, this little C-clip ring. Um, getting it back together is super easy. Just clamp it. It snaps in place, but getting it out, oh, it's Ooh. tough. Oh, yeah. I'll be using M12 threaded rods because on a homemade bar clamp, I used M10, which works pretty well, but often wish to have the higher thread pitch to open and close the jaw more quickly. So now the question is how to get M12 threads inside the wooden frame. One option would be to just cut the threads directly into the wood. And from a manufacturing standpoint, this would be ideal. Drill one hole, cut one thread, and it's done. But are these strong enough? This is about the handle size I'll be using. Let's try strip the threads with that. Going as hard as I can, both handed, with gloves, the threads arrived. And let's be honest, this is a load the clamp so somebody just pointed out uh, you should get rid of the chat window in the uh, what you're streaming so that there's more room for the video. Because I was just checking actually the live stream does have the chat window in it. That's actually a very good comment. I don't know, I don't know if that's easy to do. It's 
not easy to Difficult. do, but it's beneficial if it stays because if you watch the video afterwards, I don't know if the chat is still you visible. Can, you can re you can replay the live chat. Okay. Um. Oh well, it's not important. It's like you know what? If you want to see the whole thing full res, go watch the actual video later. Yeah, I think it is more harm than good if I try to uh, fill around with the stream now. But I see another question for me. Um, how much time did you invest in optimizing the steps for mass production? <sighs> Difficult question. I, I built a whole prototype clamp uh, before I recorded anything just to see what challenges will occur and I knew um, they already figured out the steps for making the the clamping pad um, and yeah just kind of started thinking about all the little setups for every individual step but I did most of the optimization while I was doing it let's we'll go never see it so is it strong enough yes but of course only until you go at it with a wrench something interesting just happened i wanted to show the threads fail when you go at it with a wrench but what actually failed first is the wood itself from the compression if i thread in the screw from the other side the threads are still mostly fine but it definitely doesn't spin anymore so let's go metal threads with a few options. I did uh, this test with M10 before and there the threads stripped completely. Uh, that I was really surprised that the M12 thread survived that well. Um, yeah, that was everything I wanted to say. Thread well, there's also, are if you, if you uh, use a wooden thread, um, if there's shrinkage and expansion, that will cause the thread to bind, and it also wears out more quickly. Yeah, but good yeah, point. It, it does hold well, but it, especially with changes in humidity, it'll actually bind on you because um, that wood getting half a millimeter or a quarter millimeter thicker is going to completely screw yeah. it up and wear. Yeah, and I really wanted the the smooth motion of the clamp handles. So metal threads, it is. Are expensive. T-nuts in M12 are almost as wide as the frame, and I don't like that. But the thin version of regular nuts seems fine, and I can cut hexagonal pockets with the panther rotor. One on this side, and one on this side. The two nuts are now kept in place, and this is obviously... Good question, I see there. Would, wouldn't one nut be enough? Definitely yes for applying the clamping force but the second nut holds it straight um, and that is also quite important the the two nuts are interlocked when the thread is all the way through with only one nut you eventually will push it out Matthias and I had that has an example. very same idea um, 10 years earlier nut in here cut with a panther rotor another <laughs> nut in here <laughs> It's a good idea, <laughs> obviously. And it still works, doesn't it? Yes. It's stronger and more durable than the wooden threads, but also more effort to make. I will still go with this solution for the simple reason that it works a lot smoother. And I want smoothly working clamp handles. On the panther router, the stock needs to be centered, which I can achieve with the centering fence. And two more stops in the front. The template I made has two functions. By following the inner hole, I can cut the through hole for the spindle. And in the first run, I did this to all pieces. Then sliding the follower to the hexagonal part and set the depth stop. And from there, it's just a plunge cut to depth, following the template around and flip the part for the second side. All done in about an hour, except for some deburring. Nice. The nuts then get pressed in with the vise. Quite some repetition in this project. Now aligning the question that goes with that, uh, wouldn't it be quicker to cut the hexagon on a CNC? Actually, no. Uh, 
getting all the pieces set up on the CNC will take longer than cutting them all on the pan router. It took me um, half an hour to do all of that work with the pan router. Once I got the hang of it, it went really quickly. This is actually, yeah, there is, depending on how much setup there is, um, the pan router is often a lot quicker than using a CNC because if it's just a simple operation, you can't walk away from the CNC while the CNC is doing its thing. And the actual milling operation is faster with a pan router because you basically, because you can hear the motor whining and all that, and you can adjust how fast you're milling based on how the bit is doing and such, which the CNC can't, which means... That depends on what size CNC you have. If the CNC is big enough, it will just power through everything and doesn't care. Uh, and it's I faster. Suppose. Well, yeah, it might break the bit. Like, and what I mean is you can dynamically kind of adjust not. the speed when you're, uh, when you're using the pantry rotor. So talking with Max Sheldon, like there's actually some factories that use pantry rotors as well instead of CNCs for some things, because if you're just cutting something like a mortise, it's quicker to put on the pantry rotor and have the guy move the lever a few times than to have the CNC do it. Because the operator still needs to be there to change all the parts if you're changing parts that quickly. Yeah. But I think you also underestimate the strength of the bits. Uh, the bit I used in the pan router was a 3 8 inch, so about 10 millimeters. If you have a powerful uh, CNC spindle and a rigid enough CNC machine, you can uh, cut like 30 millimeters deep really fast all in one go through hardwood. The bit doesn't care. Oh. It, if you see that live, that's pretty amazing. Let's continue. Threads of the second nut with the first one when it's all the way in is basically a game of luck. And most of the time it will end up binding like this. So then I pull the nut back out, turn it by 60 degrees, push it back in and retry. On this one it seems like it already did the trick and now it spins freely. Doing this to all of them will take... So there's a comment about, uh, and I get that comment too, why don't you just use an Acme thread? It's like, well... You know, oh, I looked. I looked for Acme threads. Uh, okay. The the spindle is really easy to get, but the nut, that's the problem. You can get the nuts also easily, but they are they are huge. They are bigger than or thicker than my clamp frames, and they just wouldn't have fit in any way. And cutting your own Acme threads with a tab, that's just not worth the effort. And way more expensive. Oh yeah. Some time and I'll also remove the nuts again for painting the frames. So I will do all the alignment after painting. So now let's cut all the threaded rod to length and start working on the clamping pad. I want the pad to be metal on metal contact with the spindle, be relatively thin and never spin as I tighten it. On a commercial version, they have a ball shape turned to the end and a matching shape in the pad. With lots of grease, it can swivel and rotate freely and the C-clip holds it together. Now I have a ball turning tool for the lathe, but it's not set up. A common solution is wedging a washer between locked nuts. I used it for my bar clamp where it works great. But this is way too thick and bulky for this clamp. Requires four additional nuts per clamp and the clamping pad is not even there yet. Bad solution here. But fastening a washer to the end in a way it can swivel, I think is the way to go. I first thought about a screw, but the solution I ended up with is better in every way. So at the lathe, I first cleaned up one side of each spindle, measured the current length, chucked it the other way, and turned it to length. Then turning a short section on the end to a pin. My target diameter is 5.3 millimeters, which isn't all that critical, because it only needs to fit an M5 washer with a little play. In production mode, I did all this with one roughing and one finishing pass. And wow, look at that surface finish. Then cleaning up the shoulder with a little undercut and a chamfer with an outside chamfer tool. Now the washer will be the metal on metal and swivel part. And to secure it in place, I hit the end with a hammer all around, which deforms the metal and the washer is now captive. I like the solution so much because it's easy and requires zero parts. Probably also the reason why manufacturers do more or less the same thing. I was pretty surprised on how well this worked when I first tested it on the prototype clamp. 
Uh, I had to do three tries before I got the fit and the size and everything correct. But it was surprisingly easy. And also the turning took like an hour. So it's not m that much machining time. The actual clamping pad, I made a solid 3D print that has a pretty snug snap-on fit onto the washer. It's a one-time assembly. Trying to separate them will break the part. How many uh, 3D prints did you have to make to, for that washer to snap in there so nicely? Mm, I think three. That's not bad. Yeah. I've done many snap fits already, so I, I roughly know what I have to do to get it working. But yeah, three. And I broke like five when fiddling around with them. <laughs> They break really easily once they are attached and you pull on them again, as I just showed in the video. <laughs> Which is okay, because unless it breaks, the part never has to come off again. And so it's the same idea as before, low part count, minimal assembly time. Doing all that work is also a good practice for your death stare. <laughs> Let's check the printer. Oh great, still 16 hours to go. Okay, so then let's make the clamp handles in the meantime. Together with the frame parts, I also milled down stock for the handles and cut them to length. I find their center, put them in my magnetic drill press vise, align it and lock the magnet. What comes now may seem strange at first, but stay with me. I'm drilling a hole about 50 mm deep and then tap it M12. I finished the threads of this blind hole with the drill because my hand has a good sense of reaching the bottom and letting go. And here one of the spin. So does your drill press reverse because you're tapping on the drill press there? It does now. Uh, I've added a VFD about a year ago. So I have oh, a little okay. switch so that I can just reverse it. It's such a nice feature. I. This is, if, if you want to upgrade your drill press, do it with a VFD at first. Variable speed, well, uh, reverse switch, do it. I would also have to switch to a three-phase motor on it because uh, the single-phase motor would not reverse. Are they difficult to get in Canada? We don't have three-phase in all of our houses like you do. Sure, but you have three-phase in industry. Yes, but not residential. So is it hard to get small three-phase motors or just buy them online? I guess I would have to buy them online. I do envy Germany that way in terms of, uh, you know, it's take it for, for granted that you have basically 400 volt three-phase, whereas here, even if you have three-phase, is it 208 volt or is it 400 volt? Because, you know, like I was talking to a guy and he bought this piece of equipment and it had a three-phase motor and he had three-phase power, but it was a 400 volt three-phase motor and he had 208 volt. What did it end okay. up doing? He had the motor rewound. All um, right. Damn. I remember when I was a kid, our washing machine had three-phase power. It's like, that's just inconceivable here. <laughs> yeah, I basically take it for granted that we have three-phase here everywhere. <laughs> Okay, Those let's continue. Can all thread all the way in. And I did it like that because with just a 12 millimeter hole, the spindle always still had some slop, which I didn't want. Sloppy and perfectly tight. And for actually transferring the force into the spindle, there will be a cross pin, which I'll also do later after painting. But the hand. That pin wouldn't have been necessary. Uh, when I tried the clamps, uh, when I was assembling them, uh, the amount of threads, of really weak threads in the clamping handle were enough to uh, bring the clamping force. But yeah, I already recorded that bit. So to be consistent, I added the pins. Handle shape is far from done. First, I chamfered the ends at the table saw and the edges on the router table or just by magic. And then I used a flap sander at max drill press speed to smooth out all edges. Why a difference? Ah, the printer is done. Except for the cross pin, this part of the clamp is done. But what about these tabs? 
They will ride along two slots in the frame, which prevents them from spinning. However, on the actual pieces, there are no slots yet. Let's fix that. One cut. That clamping pad not spinning was one key feature I wanted to add. The Bessie doesn't do that because it's just machined nicely and lubricated nicely, but cheaper clamps, the pad always spins. It's so annoying. And on an edge especially, that cannot happen or the edge shifts and then you're in big trouble. If you what don't happens, notice it early enough. I think on the enough. cheaper clamps a lot is uh, this neck here ends up actually hitting the hole here and that's kind of a wedge it wedges into the hole and yeah there's not nearly enough of that and it spins and yeah that i find that and especially when you're i'm not talking edge clamps here because then as the pad spins as you tighten it the clamp wanders on you and that is very annoying on cheap clamps and of course that's something i encounter all the time because i use cheap clamps almost exclusively yeah me too i know the problem <laughs> But <laughs> from each side makes a perfectly centered slot. All right, and now the most difficult but also most interesting part, the eccentric cams that make the clamp auto adjust to any thickness. Well, actually it's not eccentric, but a spiral curve. But besides the shape, it also needs to have a very grippy. I see a question there. Uh, how many people would have just glued the handles on? That would have been really dumb. I would have. Uh, because when it's glued on, you cannot assemble it anymore. You could have only glued it on on the final assembly. So don't screw that up if you go that approach. I suppose if you need to fix them. I was pausing it about the uh, the cams, which um, Mary's had actually... Um, this is a back and forth on us too. So I had assumed that he had used a uh, exponential sort of spiral, but it turns out he used an involute spiral. Uh, which has a non-constant uh, clamping angle and in my video I was explaining about the ratio of the force the spreading force versus clamping force it's like oh this is not constant what do we do about this now and I convinced him to remake all those parts uh, which he mentions slightly later in the video that he had to make those parts again to an exponential curve which I think made for a much better clamp because the way it was as the clamp flexes you get less of a mechanical advantage with the involute clamp, with the involute shape. Yeah, that was a not so nice moment when I realized that. <laughs> I was just finished making all of the cams, which took me half a day. Um, and then I noticed, oh, the shape is incorrect. It's really subtle. When you compare the cams next uh, next to each other, you almost can't tell the difference, but it is there. Luckily, you hadn't glued the rubber to them yet. Oh yeah, luckily. <laughs> I was about to. Preferably rubberized edge. It needs to be spring-loaded, so it comes back to a neutral position. And it also needs to have an end stop. There's a lot going on. The most difficult part will be the spring-loading, so let's get that sorted first. On here, they used a steel torsion spring, pretty stiff one, but that's not a part you can just buy. So my first attempts were using rubber bands or actually tiny O-rings. One end. There are more questions about the uh, cam shape. Uh, so what shape is it exactly? It's, uh, it's either search for exponential spiral or logarithmic spiral and Basically, its key feature is keeping a constant uh, pressure angle. And what I was using before was a, not an uh, involute spiral, just a regular spiral. I, I think there's a little bit of a difference as well. But just search for a logarithmic spiral. There we get the formula and what it looks like would be fixed in place in a channel in the cam the other end to the frame and then as you rotate it the rubber band gets wrapped around the center and as you can see this looked pretty promising and worked well well these are all the prototypes i made before uh would you have 3d printing the cams <laughs> see the latest comment i considered it but it would have taken much longer than 
uh, milling them from wood. I also got a lot of comments. Why didn't I just print the whole clamp? Uh, <laughs> sure. One clamp frame would take about 10, 15 hours to print. Multiply that by 30 and you have a month worth of printing. Not quite, but you get my point. Same with the cams. The yeah, CNC is just a lot faster. And the benefits of having it printed are basically non-existent in that case. And the filament, filament cost? That would have been quite reasonable, I think, like 50 euros. And that's a, and then, I see a funny question. <laughs> Did I charge uh, for consulting you? I think that, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of, I did. Uh, I paid about 80 euros in shipping for getting those clamp frames to him as quick as possible. Man, it is expensive if you chose express shipping uh, over the Atlantic Ocean to Canada. And now I have something to burn. And also yeah. he's going to send me some clamps as well. They are shipped already. That didn't work. But there's this one fatal flaw. After about 20 to 50 cycles, the O-ring would always snap. And unfortunately, this just doesn't work. So guess who bought some spring steel wire and has a task ahead of himself? My first attempts were definitely experimental. Some <coughs> research later, well, a This Old Tony video, I knew I needed some tooling. Hmm. Okay. I filed a flat spot onto a shaft to drill and tap a hole, which is then used to clamp the wire. This goes in the drill press chuck, and with the belts and speed set slow, I gave it a go. Well, shit. Um, let's try again. That's not bad. Uh, okay, now, now it's bad. Well, at least it's a coil. Sort of. Three times the charm. Ah, that's what I wanted to see. Nice tight coils. And the spring is a bit less garbage. I think I need a better way of... I had a good laugh editing this bit of the video with the failed springs. I had even more clips of it just not working. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was pretty funny to do that. And uh, matching question to that, was the spring steel expensive? Uh, surprisingly, yes. Uh, I ordered two 10 meter coils of 0.6 millimeter wire that were 15 euros each. And then I ordered a 20 meter coil of 0.7 millimeter and that was about 30 euros. So it's not terribly expensive, but it's more than you would think. Feeding the wire. So I cut another flat spot to some brass stock, then cleaned the face and the diameter just to get that sexy footage, cut it off and drilled a tiny through hole. At the flat spot, I cut some more threads for this brass screw. All this goes in the vise, the wire comes through the hole and the screw clamps it to create consistent tension. And here we go. Oh, great, much better results. Ah, forget it. Well, let's try the wire feeder closer. Ah, uh, shit. Great, another one of these. Okay, now we're getting results. Better, but not consistent yet. I have to make over 60 identical springs and looking at the results so far, I can't see myself doing it that way. Let's try something else. Some more questions uh, regarding the spring steel, where I bought it, just from eBay. And welding wire would also do. Uh, no, the tensile strength of uh, spring steel wire is insane. It's, if you can work with that number, it's uh, 2000 Newton per square millimeter, which is, yeah, it's basically the max you can get steel to. And also not all bolt cutters can cut that without getting damaged. So it's pretty important to keep notice so that so you don't damage your cutters. 
and welding wire is very brittle sometimes. Oh, it I, don't, is. I don't have. I have to use flux core. Or maybe the uh, maybe the one that you used with the MIG welder is a bit better. Okay, I don't have and a welder yet, thick. so I don't know. All right. Welding is too fragile. Yeah. Let's go. Would you look at that? Good and consistent results, and it was easy. Shout out to the spring guy whose method I basically just copied. Let me show you. I couldn't believe how well this worked. The tool I use here is my wood lathe with a chuck and a drill bit. The belt is removed and a makeshift hand crank attached to the end. A drill would work exactly the same. The hand crank is just easier to handle. Now the magic behind all this is this wire catching hook. It's one of those cases where, you know, you think of all kinds of complicated things and then a crank is just, duh. It reminds me of my uh, slinky escalator thingy, which uh, I tried running it with a drill. It was so hard to control the national with a crank on. It's like, oh, this is so dead easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's also a question for you. How would you have approached the spring problem? Uh, I was just watching this and I was thinking, you know, when you're doing it on the drill press, I might have been tempted to just wind like as much as I could on the drill press and then cut it and unbend some parts of it to do the ends of it. Like that okay. sort of, uh, that, and that might have worked so that I would have never, your, your uh, lathe method is more elegant. And since I don't have a nice lathe that I could do that with, that's probably the method I would have used. Okay. I, I guess you would probably also have done some re re research once you get garbage springs. Uh, the the method I show here, I found that pretty quickly after uh, the this old Tony video, which pops up first, of course. Made from the same spring steel wire. And making it is quite simple. Start with a drill bit in the chuck, loosely put a wire inside the chuck jaws and start coiling. The coil will spring back and then find a bigger drill bit that's a hair too big and push the coil on that. Back in the chuck, take a short piece of the same wire and bend the open end around it. Then close it all the way and cut off the excess to create the hook. Shorten the other side and it's done. It's such I'm a to pause beautifully simple. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, you make it sound like, oh yeah, then find the bigger drill to, for it to fit snugly. This is kind of backwards because, of course, you're aiming for the right size spring. So I imagine you uh, had to work back from the drill that you ended up needing to get the right diameter of relaxed spring and then make the other sp the tooling spring small enough that it fits snugly on the, dr on the dr drill that you're targeting. Actually, no. I picked the first drill bit just by random and then made the tool and then the spring i got was by sheer luck the perfect size and i could work with that oh cool but yeah if i would have aimed for a specific size you would have uh, worked backwards simple concept as it clamps itself onto the drill bit and will never slip okay so now i can consistently wind springs also in different size now I need to figure out what's the right size and the amount of windings and how to mount the springs to work in the clamps. So to start somewhere, I took one of the sample springs, bent a hook to one end and this to the other end, then made a matching cam on the CNC router. The hook fits into this hole and the rest of the spring around the center. And this end fits into a hole on my test block. Let's see, this is the neutral position and it works really first try no way but yeah that's exactly what i need i'll take it so it would be one two three windings with the diameter this setup produced and i'm pretty confident the hooks and holes also work but can i also assemble it long end goes into a hole in the frame hook into the hole in the cam and I can get it in. Oh yeah, it works. 
As you can see, I've done a bunch more testing trying to make the ideal spring, varying the amount of windings, and I also went up to a thicker 0.7 mm wire diameter to get them a bit stiffer. But what it all came down to in the end was, can I assemble it? Take a look. This spring with the hooks next to each other is super simple to assemble, but puts the cam in an awkward starting position about here. So I have to pre-tension it all the way to here to get it to clamp neutral, and then it doesn't have enough travel. This spring with hooks on opposite ends puts the cam in a perfect neutral position about here, but it's so hard to assemble, there's no way I'm doing that for all of the clamps. So the solution is an in-between spring that has the advantages of the other two, and I've already got it installed here. Oh, I like that. And it also already has the stop included. We'll get to that. Now I have to make more springs. The hooks I made by bending over the ends with some round tip pliers, then pinching the bend a bit more and cut off the excess. And there I've got all the springs made, but they aren't of much use without all the features in the frame pieces. And that is drilling the hole for the pin and adding a chamfer. Then drilling the hole for the spring and stop feature and adding a chamfer. By the way, every operation has its own setup. The roundover starts at the bandsaw, gets finished at the belt center and adding a chamfer. Here we are now. Yeah, this uh, is before. <laughs> Uh, the question that was asked before with did I optimize for production right there? Uh, I figured that out while I was doing it. And I kind of also screwed it up because uh, the splines that I will glue in shortly, I should have done in the beginning. It was a lot more work doing all of that afterwards. But I think the uh, my convincing you to use the splines came part way into the process. I knew I wanted to add them long before I recorded this and, and did all of that. I just forgot. <laughs> and then when I had all the round over done, oh shit, I need to add the splines. Ah, oh, this will take another day of work, which it did. <laughs> but it's worth it. Um, and one detail I never mentioned, uh, maybe you can see it on the clamp, the pinhole location is off center. It's a little bit uh, further to the clamp center. So that here is a little bit more material that supports the pin. Uh, we talked about that briefly, I think, but I never mentioned it in the video. But yeah, little optimization I did here as well. The uh, the frames he sent me, the, the parts um, all have the hole right in yeah. the middle still though. They were still centered. All right, let's continue. Now adding reinforcement splines Matthias recommended. The bantor curve is ideal for the spline thickness. Then cutting matching splines to thickness and length. And with glue on every surface, I can push and clamp them in place. Afterwards, I of course have to flush trim. So did anybody comment about uh, how it's so dangerous to cut between the blade and the fence like that? <laughs> no, because it's oh, absolutely not dangerous. You just know where well, you have to stand, not behind the saw blade. And you couldn't see it in the video. Let me uh, go back a few seconds. Um, then cutting. Yeah, here, the fence is at the center of the blade. So everything that's in the back here cannot get pinched between the fence and the blade. So it will not throw this piece in my face. What it will do is shoot the thin strip back out with little, it just drops to the floor. It doesn't go very, very far, but you just naturally don't stand there when you use the saw. The The shape and the design of the sliding table saw kind of forces you to stand next to the blade, not behind the blade. And after using it 10 years, you, you do it just, it's just so normal. You don't even think about it. Yeah, I find these uh, European table saws a bit awkward in terms of where I'd like to stand. 
um, and to just not stand directly in front of it, I think that just happens naturally. It's just the way I use my push sticks and stuff, I'm always off to the side because I get much better, much better control that way. Anyways, yeah, you but would get used have... pretty quickly to to one if you have to use it. We don't have. I'm just using the mouse here. Yeah. Uh, um, we don't have fences that you can just slide back like that on our North American table saws, unlike you Europeans. I can't understand why you don't have that. This is the best feature on the table saw. And it's it because makes... we use cheap junk here because it's cheap. No, but but also the the more expensive saws don't have that, like a saw stop. Why can't you pull the fence rail back? Well, it's so I beneficial think... for everything, setting it up as a stop block or just making sure pieces don't get pinched between the blade and the fence. I'll, I, I'll tell you why, because on, on your style table saw, the blade is fairly close to the front because you have the shaper behind it, even though you don't have a shaper in your saw, you got the hole for it. So on these uh, combination type European saws, the blade is always very close to the front. On the North American saw, it's more towards the back, which possibly is a thing for thinking safety, which of course also means you have more need for the outfeed table. But then what you really want is your fence to be stiff, which means it needs to be clamped on the front and the back. Your European type fence is only clamped on the front. And that means by the time you get towards the back of the saw, it can really flex. I can tell you one thing, it never does that. And if it does, it, it depends. If you have a really, really thick piece, uh, like a solid piece of hardwood that you cut in half and has lots of tension in it. Um, you don't ever expect accuracy from that cut in the first place because the tension releases and then the board is uh, like makes a curve again. And for everything else, you don't push as hard on the fence that you would deflect it. It is pretty stiff. Uh, sometimes, it, especially with, because imagine that fence extending twice as far, and then if you're pushing the wood hard against the fence, which in this case I would be, because if the wood isn't quite straight, I push it hard against the fence to make sure that the, the thin piece I'm cutting off is going to be a consistent thickness. Which of course it wouldn't well, be if I was pushing hard against the fence. From my experience, you wouldn't notice it. But, I mean, what I think now is, except I'm too lazy, I never think of it at the time, is to make a sacrificial fence that just ends halfway across the blade for cutting splines like that. So if I had to cut 100 splines, I probably would. But usually it's just a few. All right. Yeah, but, but why isn't this feature built in? I, I, I mean, also, your saw does clamp on front and back, but yes. other more expensive saws don't do that. They also only have a fence rail in the floor, front and oh, it's true. they are made yeah. from, they have a steel beam, which is stiffer than the aluminum extrusion, but I also don't clamp in the back. Mm, true. Well, we are, we are rambling. Saw. We are getting it off topic. Like Let's get back to the video. <laughs> Matching splines to thickness and length. And with glue on every surface, I can push and clamp them in place. Afterwards, I of course have to flush trim and drill through all holes again and are finally making the big cutouts for the cams. I built a jig for the table saw to hold the pieces securely, aligned the saw tooth with my mark and made two cuts. I built that jig twice. The first one was too inaccurate, uh, the piece shifted and I just didn't get consistent results at all. It was really annoying. What you need is, quick, is a quick set tenon jig and then you could have done the whole slot in one operation and flattened the bottom of it. I thought of it while I was doing these operations, but building it would have taken longer than using this, this well, little thing. Well, you see, then you can build a quick set tenon jig and make a project out of that while you're building the jig for making your other project that you still haven't gotten to yet. But then this video wouldn't have been released yet. Yet. <laughs> The middle gets removed at the bandsaw. It took a couple attempts to get the amount of play just right, but then it went rather quickly. On top of removing the middle, I set up the fence and the stop lock to clean that bottom surface with the side of the blade. A noticeable difference. Most of the new edges I could then chamfer with the router 
and the rest with the flap sander. And with that all of the part features are done and they are ready to be glued. Now the effort of making the double mortise and tenon pays off. Because all I need to do is spread glue in the mortises and on the tenons, then push and clamp them together, remove the glue squeeze out and it's done. No need to check for square or deal with a big glue mess. And once fully pushed, no further clamping is needed, I can just let them dry like this. While the glue is drying, I can cut the cams on the CNC router, which is boring to watch, so here are the interesting bits. That was a time lapse of the first batch that I throw away again. I use a good amount of bolts and T-nuts to hold the stock to the table. To locate it on the wasteboard, I have a pin in my hole grid that will fit this hole which puts it in the same spot as in my software. And then I load the program and start the job. Yeah, boring, except for the automatic tool changes. The last operation is flattening everything to thickness. And that's why I've sunken the bolts below the surface. I also optimize the tool paths in a way so when the job is done, I'm left with clean and sharp edges everywhere. And I made three of them. For the other side, I machine another locating hole into my wasteboard. Hmm. Let's call it friction milling. Oops. But now I could use the hole from before and one of the machined ones for locating. Here I also managed to prevent tear out by first machining a slight chamfer and then the contour. I see a question to uh, the tenon jig topic again. Why I didn't use a dado blade. We could start rambling about this again, so I make it quick. Uh, I don't have one because my saw can not take one. They are mostly forbidden in Europe, except I could have equipped my saw with an arbor that's specifically made for one special kind of dado blade that would have cost like 400 euros. And at the time I was buying the saw, I thought, yeah, that's just not worth it. I won't be using this feature as much. Give me the standard arbor. Then I cut the parts free, flush trim the holding tabs and take care of all sharp edges. I enjoyed making these cams so much that I thought, hmm, let's screw up the geometry and do it all over. The grippy stuff on here seems like some kind of rubber silicone material and also looks like being cast in place. Surprise, surprise, I can't do that. The best alternative I could find is this solid rubber edging material. Mmm, car tire. I posted this on Instagram and got quite funny responses from you. I guess that was a really fun experiment. <laughs> you should, <laughs> you should, uh, if you want, go uh, watch the video after the live stream and read through the answers. It's pretty funny what you came up with. <laughs> These jigs for cutting and chamfering the rubber need no explanation. But for better glue adhesion, I scratched the surface with 60 grit, cleaned it and applied the glue. It's one of those contact type glues that you spread to both surfaces, then wait and then press them together. I did that by kind of rolling it on while keeping it straight. That was surprisingly tricky to get right. The cams are 16.5 millimeters thick and the rubber is 15 millimeters thick. And it's extremely important that none of the rubber overlaps the edges because then it wouldn't have worked in the clamp. It would have get stuck all the time on the exposed rubber. So I had one and a half millimeters of tolerance, which sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. And also as you press the cam with the rubber onto the table, it kind of expands a little bit and bulges out. And what also happened on some is that the glue started squeezing out a bit and overlapped the edge. It was a lot of cleaning up glue after I had all of that glued on. But I, I cut all that out. That wasn't really You're interesting. saying it was surprisingly difficult. Uh, I'm going, I'm surprised it worked uh, because I would expect that to be very difficult. I knew 
it, it I did four tests before and there I figured out, oh, I have to make the cams quite a bit thicker than I anticipated. I wanted to go with 15 millimeters in the beginning. I thought, yeah, I got 15 millimeter thick rubber, wide rubber. Yeah, just do it the same and then, oh, yeah, problems. But it was okay with the thickness I went with. One end gets secured with a staple, the other with a little nail, being careful to miss the hole. Oh yeah, and here it turned out that the nail and staple are extremely important. Uh, on the tests I did, I didn't include them. And after a day, the ends of the rubber started to lift up again. By now, the glue in the frames is bone dry, so I cut off the corners and sand over all sharp edges before applying one more question to the rubber. Did you consider bicycle inner tube? I'm sure that's what Matthias would have used. <laughs> um, yes, actually in my tests and in fact in my video, I talk about this briefly um, because I, uh, my favorite method of using edge, doing edge clamping is just to put an F clamp over the edge and then put a wedge behind it. Um, and I measured how much force it would took to slide that off and it was okay. It's like, well, let's just put some rubber in there to make it slide less easily, and it actually made it worse. So it turns out inner tube rubber is a fairly soft rubber. Um, it's great for things that don't require a whole lot of pressure, but once you apply a whole lot of pressure, that does not increase the coefficient of friction with it at all. It actually makes it worse. So when I put the rubber between the clamp pads and the wood and tried to pull off test again, it pulled off substantially easier than without. And adding to that, with also a question uh, using silicone. Um, so first, the rubber I used is really solid rubber. It's basically like a car tire. It's pretty hard. It smells like a car tire, really. The problem it has, it also, when you slide it over a surface, you leave some rubber behind. That doesn't happen with the Bessie clamp. And that must be some kind of silicone stuff. It also doesn't smell at all. And I think there's a lot of engineering that went into making this rubber work the way it does. It, the grip on this and the wear resistance is pretty perfect. Yeah, and, and I abused this clamp quite a bit. Uh, you notice the gap on this is a bit bigger than it started out with in Maris's. Um, and I pulled this clamp off a few times, basically. And of course, the harder you pull, the stronger these wedges pull push inward. And uh, it was uh, over 250, so over a quarter ton, to pull this clamp off of uh, off of whatever it's clamped to. And uh, you can see some slight scuff marks on there, but you couldn't say that it's damaged. So it's amazing stuff. And it grips fairly well um, at the high pressures, much better than the rubber did. So it, it is good material. And they also make it, uh, it looks like it's injection molded uh, with two yeah, separate materials. Or they have the, the gray plastic part made first, put it in some kind of mold and then apply the liquid rubber stuff and then it hardens. Uh, I think it's not easy to make them and make them as good as they are. A finish. I like the look of this hammered finish. However, I have never used it before and it's not specifically made for spraying. But then they also sell the stuff in spray cans, so why not? A simple de uh, What you could see how much thinner I added, I added quite a bit more off camera. I, I didn't know at all how much I would need. It's about a 30% mixture now. So 70% uh, paint, 30% thinner. You just need to do tests and put a stick in the paint and see how, how fast it, it's running and then try it out in the spray gun. You can always thin it down in the spray gun. It's really easy to work with. Now gives me perfect access to all sides. And what can I say? Spraying went wonderful. One detail is also to add, 
Uh, I showed that spray can that they sell this stuff in a spray can and I did a test with that before and it just didn't turn out like that mit the hammered look at all. Just normal paint. And I was really, uh, should I really try this paint on all that work I went through? And then I said, just try it on a sample piece. And the thing, the key thing is, uh, I think why the spray can doesn't work. There's always paint coming out. Uh, with the spray gun, you can control how much paint is uh, coming. So at first you only spray air and then you pull the trigger a bit more and then a little bit of paint comes out. And yeah, that really, I think, is the key to get this working nicely. So if you want to try it, use a spray gun. It's worth the effort. Then picking the parts up with a wire and hang them for drying. This is the result after two coats. What a success. The clamp handles I could partially thread on the spindles, spray them red, and they already have a hanging device built in. Pretty cool. With the paint dry, I sanded the raised grain of the inner surfaces so the cams don't rub on it. And then tapped the countersink holes for the stopping screws. Okay, a few more questions about the paint. Uh, oh does yeah, it, there's Jordan. Does it there's Jordan, he's asking crack me. over time when the wood is flexing? Um, so far not. Uh, I show a demonstration of the clamps at the end. They were, it was clamped for five days and yeah, the, the clamp frame was spread apart quite significantly. I don't know, this paint is quite a bit flexible and you can't really see the imperfections in the video. Uh, you can see the, like the joint gap. I don't know if it shows nicely, but then there the whole gap just uh, the joint just opens up a little bit and closes again when you release the pressure but so far the paint's doing well and now i'm ready for the final assembly first the two nuts where i now make sure they are aligned to each other and spin freely then threading in the spindle with the clamping pad and thread on the handle now two cams springs pins and screws Installing the spring is still fiddly, but works. And with the tiny amount of paint in the holes, the pin now is a good press fit. And now the stopping screw. The end of the screw rides in this track. This end stops it at the neutral position. And this end limits the max opening and prevents the spring from damage. Then the other side. That's also what made the CNC operation of the cams a little bit more work because I had to do a two-sided operation. So after the first side was done, flip it around, bring it into position again and make a separate program for the second side. I'm reasonably fast at it now, but it adds quite a bit of time. And repeat the whole procedure 30 more times. The threads and the pads then got some grease and after the last operation at the drill I think I would have cut that cavity with a pad rotor <laughs> on the other side. Just make a template for that and because it's a, such a simple operation. But of course, you, I think you had them all still in the whole thing all together so that it uh, before yeah. you cut them out of the frame. Uh, my first tests I did, I made a little template to put one after the other in the CNC. And yeah, when I did the production, uh, it occurred to me, yeah, just do it in a bunch uh, when they're all attached to the board. And yeah, the second side didn't take long in terms of machining time, but figuring out the setup and getting it right took not that long, but yeah, it's some time. Press where I drilled a hole for the cross pin. They are all done. That was a journey and this one is already damaged. Did you count? I made 31 clamps. <laughs> Here are 10 each lined up and I'm holding the 
last one uh, it had not everything was right on it so I uh, wanted to sacrifice it for the test and yeah this is already after I had done the test with Stefan that was a journey and this one is already damaged well that's because I've visited Stefan from CNC kitchen and his load cell there we could test what my clamps can actually push. The clamp grips on a material sample and pushes the two levers together which are connected to the load cell. I've used a torque wrench for a consistent and reasonable force that I would also apply by hand and that doesn't damage anything. The screen then shows the force which because of the lever needs to be doubled and I converted it to kilograms which is easier to grasp. And like this I tested hardwood, softwood, plywood, particle board, plastic, and finished wood. Doing this test was so boring. The numbers are almost equal. There was just nothing interesting happening. Uh, I, I had to think quite a bit how to do that at least a little bit interesting in the video. So that's what I came up with here. I was really expecting the plastic to do a lot worse because it is really slippery and also the finished wood part here that is quite a slippery finish but yes it's, it's all the same it, yeah. it could be that uh, like with the inner tube rubber that I was running into that um, once you apply enough force that basically the rubber becomes a limiting factor um, certainly with the inner tube rubber it was and that your rubber though much better than inner tube rubber may also be subject to the same sort of thing so Marius is, I asked Marius to also send me some samples of his rubber so that I can do some tests with that as well because I'm curious I'm sure it's better than the inner tube rubber but it may also be a very limiting factor what's also happening is that once the max force is reached it slowly decreases again and eventually settles I think nobody caught this in the video. You can see the rubber here on the cam is lifting up. And this is the one I sacrificed. And I think that was the issue. The, the glue wasn't sticking as well. That was before I sanded the rubber to give the glue better adhesion. And you can also see this is the test where I pushed it to more or less the limit not quite a limit but really high almost 60 kilos that was just to get a nicer curve over time of the the sliding effect it does happen on the Bessie as well but I think it loses about 10 kilos over time and my clamps lose about 20 when pushed to 60 kilos initially when I pushed them to 30 kilos which is kind of the normal use case, then they lose about five to 10 kilos. Overall, so not I will, spectacular. I will be doing some tests once I get Maris's clamps. I've also built a jig that is significantly more rigid than this sort of setup for specifically testing how well it'll hold the force. Um, so I'm planning on making a follow-up video once I get these clamps, and I've also done some more experiments with the Bessie clamp, um, attempting to break it, and I still haven't broken it, and I've pulled on, on the frame with half a ton. And uh, I've kind of, for the time being, it's like, okay, there's a really, I mean, I can, I can break it by brute force, but it appears to be strong enough. I can also add something to the test setup, because why it is the way it is, it, these are two 3D printed levers printed pretty solid they were surprisingly stiff but all this happened in less than a day we didn't have much time i uh, wrote stefan hey could we do this in this test and he was sure and i was like can we do it like tomorrow because i wanted to have to get the video done uh and he said yeah sure but uh, i can only come up with this and this so it is what it is. It wasn't too bad, except that it hurt me. So I brought one clamp to sacrifice and pushed it to the limit, which turned out to be the rubber.
63 kilograms, however, is still impressive. But what about the commercial one? It crushed through this test, going over 200 kilograms until the test levers broke and I took them to the face. <laughs> but this, uh, the, the little cut I got wasn't really that bad. It didn't hurt. What did hurt, I got this, uh, what's it called? Socket driver. Yeah, the socket, uh, yes, the socket. The socket. I got this uh, right here on the nose and that was heavy and I felt that five days after it happened. Nothing damaged my nose, but that was what hurts. The, yeah, the little cut, it healed really nicely. You almost can't see it anymore. I got lucky. Oh yeah. 200 kilograms until the test levers broke and I took them to the face. Oh yeah, and the first thing Stefan did, he gave me this little towel thing and then grabbed the camera. Like get it on, get it on video. That's <laughs> the number one priority. But after he checked that it wasn't really that bad. Well, he's uh, he's obviously an experienced YouTuber. <laughs> he is. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you, Stefan. I will remember. Stop looking at it. And honestly, it made for the perfect thumbnail because it wasn't faked. And yeah, I think it really was the eye catcher of the thumbnail. Now let's use the clamps as intended. So glue goes on, then the edge, and then the clamps as you'd expect. When I use the clamps normally like this and everything has settled, that's like having a 20 kilogram weight every 10 centimeters. And that's plenty to glue on an edge. And now it's five days later and the clamps are still tight. They didn't slide themselves loose. Excellent. This project is a total success. One question remaining, are they any better than these? In terms of overall performance and quality, obviously no. But I made them more user friendly. Take a look. From the shape, you would intuitively think you can just slide them onto a workpiece. And that works for thinner stuff, but not for thicker stuff. And my clamps aren't any better. So you have to manually open the cams, slide it on, and same for sliding off. That's awkward. It's the same on mine, but I integrated these tabs for your fingers. And they make this easy. Quite important feature, I think. And I would say this is the signature feature of these clamps. I mean, the rest of the We're design already exists. I kind of rebuild it to make it possible out of wood. But that little usability feature is, yeah, just nice. Were the tabs part of your original cam design as well? No, I had that idea after I used the Bessie myself and thought that's so awkward to use them. The rubber is so good at sticking at adhering to stuff. It doesn't want to slide off or on. Uh, you really have to lift it up. And yeah, it was just awkward to get them spread apart properly. And it was the same with mine. Then I thought, hey, I have some space for finger there. I tried it when it had the some prototype cams that didn't have this little tab and I was moving it there and thought, yep, yeah, that's the perfect position. I have space, put that there. And some people in the comments on the video also mentioned, uh, maybe Bessie is copying that design. I don't think so. And maybe they'll do then I made the world a tiny little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> they are also yeah, easy to well. store because I built them flat and stackable to nicely fit in a box or drawer. If you want to win five of the clamps, just leave a standalone comment saying, I want the clamps. If you want to comment more than that, make this a separate comment. This will be easier because in a week I will randomly draw one of the I want the clamps comments and try to contact you by answering to that.
Also, check the video description. And last surprise, next weekend Matthias and I will host a live stream together where we watch this video together and pause it. Yeah, surprise, surprise, we're doing that now. Uh, the video is done now. There's nothing new coming. So, that was more or less the experiment of watching and reacting to the video. Now, I think we have quite some more time to answer questions. And I will do the giveaway shortly. Let's see. Huh. Who owns more clams? Me or you? Oh, uh, I don't know how many clams I have. That's difficult. But if if what I see in your videos is any indication, then I think I got you beat. Well, what you can see right now in frame, I think you can see about hmm, 40 clamps without the edge clamps. I counted them once, but it's not quite 100. Almost. Okay, I'm pretty sure I'm over 100. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap ones. How many videos do each of you have in production at any given time? Uh, for me, I'm working on one right now. I, uh, I switched a bit to doing more extensive projects that uh, more complex and require just a lot of work and take time. Yeah, so only one. I used to usually have about three videos that were like almost ready for publishing. I mean, I only work really on one, but I usually keep uh, a few videos and then decide which to publish and then publish like weekly. And I decided to go weekly to uh, throttle myself a bit so I'd always have some kind of ready to go and there have been times where I had one ready to go and then Steve Ramsey did one on that very same topic so I decided to like switch the order and spontaneously decide to publish my video on that topic as well on the same day um, but that's not the case anymore now since kids I just don't have the same amount of time anymore and I stopped doing weekly because I can't keep up with weekly and yeah. so now it's just I work on the video and when it's done it's done there's sometimes I've got some stuff some some scenes shot for a future video where I'm doing something that I can't redo afterwards, like some experiments that take a long time. Uh, so I may have some clips for future videos shot already, which I may or may not use. But in general, I'm just working on one video until it's done. And then I usually publish it very shortly thereafter. Just, I like the spontaneity of it. It's like, well, how well did it do? I also, I, there was a time where I could do weekly, but my project just take way too long to get them done in a week. And same question that goes along with that. If my more complex projects split them up into individual parts, I don't like that approach because I, I've done multi-part series um, projects in the past and seeing you get a hundred thousand views on the first one and you want to kind of tell the story of the whole project. So in the next video, only 60,000 watch it. And you lose so much audience. Uh, yeah. Just putting it all together in one easier to watch video does a lot better. And I personally also like to watch that more than multi series parts. Yeah. I find too, like having the definitive video on a topic is better in terms of getting views, but um, if it's a video that takes months and months, if, if it's like, for instance, my uh, 20 inch, my 26 inch bandsaw build, like that took a few months just with the time I had and whatnot. Um, I, if I had waited for that to be done, it's like I would have had no video for a few months. But then a few months after I published the last video, I edited it into one definitive, this is the bandsaw build video, which is made it easier to edit it shorter because the more time has passed, the less you're attached to all the scenes you've shot, so it's easier to delete them. Yeah. Um, and that video ended up getting more views than any of the uh, individual ones because it's sort of the definitive video about how to build this bandsaw. Okay, we have more questions, but I will do the giveaway now to 
get this done as well. So I'm using this pickerwinner.co page. I already put in the link to the video. And I know some of you thought you could outsmart the system by commenting more than a single time. I want the clams to get higher chances. Well, this site outsmarted you long before. Here, allow duplicates. No. So only one is counting. Let's see. Oh, it counts them up. I think the video has over 8,000 comments. Oh, this is going to take a while. <laughs> this is going to take a while. It's insane. 8,000 people wanted to join this giveaway. Yeah, I think we have uh, time you know for a I few questions then. <laughs> If I was doing this, I would I don't try. I would have a feature that uh, you know, if you have multiple comments, that uh, I would uh, lower the chance of those or even exclude them. Yeah, but deleting the duplicates is fine. Okay, question for you: When will you finally get the three D printer? Oh, when will I get a three D printer? Yeah. I have no plans on getting one. You know, there's a, occasionally there's uh, you know where a tiny little plastic part would be handy, but there's so much uh, time that I have to invest in learning the tooling, the, the software, and all that for it, and then it takes so long to print, and you know it's just so much faster to just make a part usually just by hand. And if you need to make a lot of them, then the printer is super duper slow. So then you'd really want more than one printer. And then also I would now need a special place for it. I would need to build an enclosure for it because I don't want the part the uh, the right. particulate emissions from 3D printers are rather high. Um, and just being a bit, you know, like having played around with particle counters in terms of dust particles, like when the 3D printer's running, that, that just shoots way up in the air. So a lot of that plastic actually, I shouldn't say a lot of it, but some of that plastic evaporates and it's in the air. Um, as it does with a hot glue gun. And so I would want this thing to be in its own enclosure and possibly vented to the outside. It just gets complicated. And 3D printing, you know, there's lots of people doing 3D printing related videos already. So there's no point in me getting into that topic at all. All right. No 3D printer for you. <laughs> I don't like uh, doing the, uh, I, I won't get into 3D printing videos. I just use it as a tool. For me, it's just a tool I use it all the time and it just has to work I don't tinker a lot with it that's why I bought a more expensive one I just wanted it to work and do stuff and it works great for me well actually I should say I did use 3d printing one time well I got I got that sent away um, when I was doing the um, the knapp joint template for uh, Mac Sheldon Oh, yeah. And the cool thing is, I, I had sent that away and I also sent him my uh, my file. And he printed it on his printer before I even got mine and had it tried out, except his print was so rough because he set it to <laughs> the fastest that the printer could go, uh, which it made for a noticeably rough printout on his. Once I got the ones from, back from PCB where they were super solid, super smooth. I have to try that also soon. Those okay. uh, like it's some kind of SLA type printing that they use, so you don't get the the or SLA with fiber. powder with nylon Sorry, powder. What? SLS printing yeah, with nylon powder to get just oh, stronger parts. And let's stop <laughs> rambling about this. Uh, the comment picker is ready, so let's pick one. So congratulations, Ian Dalton. I hope I pronounced it correctly. It's a I want the clamps comments. So I will answer to your comment and then we will figure stuff out from there, how I will get them shipped to you. I have all of them here. I have my logo on them. And uh, I hope it's not outside Europe that the shipping will be again expensive. I will, I will, <laughs> I, I will pay the shipping. Correct. Don't worry about that. But <laughs> yeah, let's hope it's in Europe, that is even... and it's better for me. <laughs> oh, 
All right. Okay, should we do a few more questions? Like five more and then we call it a day. Uh, one question sure. I saw repeatedly was, will we do any other collaborations together? That is something to decide when we have something to collaborate on. That really depends on the project. This was just the perfect match. And if it's not the perfect match, then the collaboration won't be as good. And yeah, you will notice that in the video. It just has to fit. And it's really difficult to find these ideas. This was also, I started with these not thinking about a collaboration and then I thought, hmm, testing joints. I know some guy that does that. Let's let's just ask him and try. And now we're it here. It is also very difficult. It's very difficult to collaborate if if it involves anything physical and it takes oh, a lot yeah. of money and a lot of time to send it across the ocean. Yeah, uh, it. We had like eight different video calls together, discussing about the shipping, what to ship you, t discussing about results, and exchanging video footage. So. I get bits from Matthias I can include in my video. He gets stuff from me. There's a lot involved to get this done and it takes time. I think four weeks we, once we started with the idea to actually have results with video. Yeah, it takes a lot of time. Yeah, the, the one time I did a uh, call collaboration with Steve Ramsey and more of a, a funny sort of video, uh, April Fool's kind of video. Um, we pretended, so the, the topic of that one was that we pretended that we could pass things back and forth through Skype, but ironically, no physical object actually got exchanged. Uh, we pretended to both be working on the same thing and pass it back and forth, but rather than send it to Steve, I just did whatever Steve did to mine and vice versa. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, but that's also very difficult to get right isn't it yeah there's one there's one operation that i've done on mine where sean steve was like oh, i should have done that it just doesn't look quite the same as mine but it was doesn't matter all right uh let's see some more questions another one from jordan why did you use belt sander, not the disc sander, when rounding the edges? Disc sander was worn out. I didn't have a replacement disc, and I have the belt sander. That was a simple choice. Oh, I remember a big question that was asked on, on my Patreon and a lot under the video. How long did it actually take to make the clamps? And was it worth it making them or just spent the $1,500 on getting 25 Bessie clamps? Uh, it took six weeks total, but I didn't work full time every day. Very often I had to wait for parts or I worked on different stuff or we had to do stuff with the collaboration. And you can't really compare that with uh, when you not make a video about it. Making the video for this added like three, four weeks. I wanted to get so many shots uh, of every production step. Uh, I have over 500 gigabytes of footage almost a thousand clips, most of them I throw away. I just try to get so many shots of everything and that just adds time. It's You can't compare making a clamp on your own or without making a video. Uh, I start rambling. I think you get my point. And was it worth making them instead of buying? Um, for me, absolutely yes. I mean, getting hands-on experience on production setups. How else would you get that knowledge 
I mean, you need to do it to get experience. And if I just wanted to buy the clams, I could have also just bought the piece of furniture I'm building that I need the clams for. So. And then you would have to be a lifestyle uh, YouTuber. Yeah. Watch me go shopping. Here's my haul. Yeah. So that's, that's my channel. I, I try to make tools myself and yeah, if you're a production setup or really making furniture buy the clamps, but for me, making the clamps was the right choice. Uh, somebody asking, why do you use the uh, pen rotor soft and not the CNC rotor? Uh, it On is this just project, a, this a was quicker. perfect. And yeah, by the time you would clamped all the pieces in the in the CNC rotor and then waited for it to do its thing, and the pan rotor is just a lot quicker because you just yeah. turn it on and zip, 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 next piece. In this case, it's a lot quicker, but everything that is related to a flat workpiece, like a sheet of plywood, then the CNC is the better choice. Oh, yeah. But then it's also mostly a part that you can't make on the pan rotor in the first place. I scroll a bit up, let's see. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But as a question, do we uh, both do YouTube full time? Yep. Yes. That's a yes for both of us. Oh, and here's a question for you. Uh, what does Matthias think of the clams? Would you make these type of clams or just buy them? Neither. I would just use an F clamp with a wedge behind it. Um, I that was, was actually quick. surprised <laughs> the uh, the uh, this one um, because I always thought you know this would be much better. But then using this one, just in terms of applying it and taking it off, it's so awkward with the cams here that uh, the F clamp isn't actually any more awkward, though this does hold better. I mean, it, you know, if I had 10 of these, I would be using them instead of the F clamps, but the F clamp is actually not that much worse to use than that because that clamp is also relatively awkward to use. Okay, and one last question. This. Uh, seems to be one for me. Any chance of getting a bigger shop? Not in the near future. I would like to have a bigger shop very often. Just, yeah, assembly of big projects would be so much easier. And getting more on tools for metalworking because I do more and more metalworking now. But I also like having the small workshop because that I think seems really authentic and many more people can relate to a workshop that size because they have something of similar size at home or even smaller and then just yeah get ideas on how I do stuff and arrange tools. That wouldn't be possible anymore with a really large shop. I would really like to have one but not in the near future. Well, you'll just have to use those YouTube millions to buy a bigger house. Huh? Oh yeah, those YouTube millions. <laughs> Please show show them to me. <laughs> okay, then I think we call it uh, yeah, a day, funny. a live stream here. Let let us know what you think about this. You can. This will be uploaded as a regular video after it's ended. You can comment on it just like regular. I do this kind of live stream alone on Patreon for other big projects. Uh, so you can check that out there if you would like to get more insights on bigger projects. But since we do the collaboration, this one was definitely public. Let, let us know, was it good? What can we do better? Was it bad? All right. Anything you got to add, Matthias? Nope. No, it's uh, we're approaching two hours, so that's pretty long yeah. already. All right, then. 
Thanks everybody for checking in and see you in the next video. Bye.